Okay, so um, we've got a lot to cover, and uh, so I think we'll just get started. And if people um, come in late, then th they can catch up. So, right. So this talk is about Zen reference counting. And I think so I'm not the presenter. Here we go. Make myself the presenter. Okay. So reference counting is a unique core part of Zen. Um, but as of about two years ago, really only two people had a, a decent idea of how it actually worked internally. My solution to this was that last year for Zen Summit, I submitted a talk uh, claiming to explain how the reference counting was going to work to force myself to actually learn it well enough to explain it to other people. In the course of doing that, I discovered a number of security vulnerabilities. Um, so those have been now been fixed, and this is the talk that I was going to give last year. So. The this stuff is quite quite complicated, and um, I, you're not going to really get how it works from you know a 30 minute talk. But what I'm hoping to do is to give you kind of a conceptual framework to hang ideas off of, so that if any of you guys do come to the ref counting code, you're not starting from scratch figuring out how it, how it works. You have kind of a template that your brain can use to actually form the ideas off of. Um, and I do think I would encourage people. We do need more than three people understanding um, how the reference counting uh, code works. I think this is also, it's interesting in and of itself, it's also an interesting case study in how early decisions, kind of seemingly innocuous decisions early in the, in the development of something can have pretty massive impacts later down the line. So uh, the plan for this talk, I think it's always easier to understand why something is the way it is if you first explain the situation and then how it solves that problem, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back in time to 2002. We're gonna describe the situation that the um, people who invented uh, Zen reference counting faced. Um, and then we're basically going to, you know, start with a simple idea, raise a problem, solve that problem, raise another problem, solve that problem, and develop it until we get to um, th something very close to the current solution. And this is reasonably complicated, so do feel free to ask questions in the chat or um, kind of raise your hand if something is is just completely not clear. Okay, 2002, remember that long ago. Um, uh, Intel was 32-bit only, so x86 was 32-bit only. Intel was trying to push everyone over to their Itanium architecture, and they said, if you want 64-bit, you're just gonna have to switch to Itanium. We're not gonna do a 64 version of, of, of x86. AMD had apparently, according to Wikipedia, announced their 64-bit extensions, but there were no um, uh, processors available yet. Uh, Intel had hyper-threading, hyper but there was no such thing as multi-core, at least for, for x86. So if you wanted more than two logical CPUs on your system, you had to buy an expensive motherboard with like multiple sockets and several interconnects. Uh, VMware was only four years old. It was founded in 1998, so 2002, they were about four years old. They had taken the IT world by storm with this new idea of server virtualization. The cloud had not been invented yet. Um, there was no hardware support for virtualization, so the um, state of the art at the time was binary translation, which involves actually reading uh, x86, so x86 binary code and translating it, in, translating it into something else. Not very fast, incredibly complicated, and there were no competitive open source um, implementation. So if you wanted to do virtualization, basically at that point on x86, VMware was your only option. So <clears throat> this is the context in which the Zen project was founded. Um, and so their core idea, the core idea that the, 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 the Kira and then those guys came up with was para virtualization. They looked at traditional virtualization and said, look, what we have here is a piece of software, the operating system, talking to a piece of software, the hypervisor. But the interface they're using to talk to each other is a hardware interface. Does that make any sense? There's a reason that software interfaces and hardware interfaces look different. Why don't we just, and the whole thing is because we're, we're, we're pretending, we're trying to give the, the, the operating system the, the illusion that it's running on real hardware. Why don't we just make a software interface? We will tell the operating system, you're running in a virtual machine. Um, we will make the interface a software interface, which is easy for, for the, the two things to talk to each other. Um, and we will just, it, it's an era, I mean, it was an idea of radical experimentation. Just throw away anything that doesn't work, try something completely different, and just see what you come up with. And of course, this came up with the, um, we got the shared rings for the um, uh, drivers, we got um, the event channel code, we got hypercalls, um, and we also got uh, PV page tables. So I don't have 
unfortunately, we're going to have to whiz through page tables. Um, so page tables basically um, map virtual memory into physical memory. So on a, on a normal system, physical memory means the actual uh, numbers on the bus, um, the addresses that, that correspond to the, the, the actual memory in, in your chip. And on a real system, what you do is you, you, you have a register called the CR3. It's a hardware register. You point that at your top-level L2. When um, the processor access some bit of virtual memory, the hardware will walk the page table and discover what, bit of phys what physical page should be used for this virtual page, and then cache that in the TLB. Uh, so OK, talking about the state of the art at the time was something called shadow page tables. Now, the first thing that I have to apologize for is the, the naming convention here. Because for some reason, um, what we do is we always call what the operating system points to as physical memory, even if that's actual, not the actual physical, physical memory, right? So the physical, physical memory we call machine memory. So this is the, what the, the actual hardware thinks of as physical memory. And what we call physical memory or guest physical memory is the virtual guest physical memory that we're presenting the guest to or we're lying about, right? So the thing is, at this time, there's no hardware virtualization. And so if you, the, to actually have virtual memory translate to the physical memory, you had to have, um, the hardware had to have normal page tables, which means that the, um, and the normal page tables doesn't know anything about guest physical addresses and so on. So you have to have the L1 page tables um, that the hardware is actually using have to contain the actual machine, uh, the, the underlying um, MFNs, not the physical memory. Um, that means that basically the hypervisor has to translate the guest physical. Uh, so the guest is making its page tables using guest physical memory. Um, and the hypervisor has to translate these L1s into L2s. And this is called the shadow, the shadow L1. Um, and the for the the higher level page tables like the L2, the this is uh, there's even another layer layer of interaction because what happens is the L2 contains the guest physical address of the L1, but the shadow L2 has to contain the machine physical address of the shadow of the L1. Okay, so as you can see, this is already this is, this is reasonably complicated even to talk about. Um, you have to do this P to M translation. Um, it's slow to keep in sync. There's a very big um, impedance mismatch between what the guest is expecting as far as how fast these operations will be and how fast they are in in, in practice. Because um, on real hardware, modifying these page tables is a simple um, memory operation, whereas uh, modifying them virtualized always involves um, somehow it has to be translated through the hypervisor. Um, on real hardware, you have dirty and access bits. Um, these have to be emulated for uh, shadow page tables. Um, and the hypervisor doesn't actually know when the shadow, when the um, page tables stop being used as page tables. Uh, and this causes a whole lot of um, a whole lot of issues. So if Zen were just to do plain shadow page tables, then uh, they would have a lot of the same performance issues that that more traditional virtualization would have. So and, the observation that the Zen people said is the real issue here is this translation, this P2M translation, right? We're lying to the, the traditional virtualization. You're lying to the guest. You, you're telling it that you have this physical memory that starts at zero and goes up to N, maybe with a few holes or something like that. Um, that's not what we do anymore. We're the modern thing. We are doing paravirtualization. So what we're going to do, the guest knows that it's running virtualized. We're not going to do this whole PFM blah, blah, blah thing. OK, we're going to give the guest straight up MFNs. Say, here's your MFNs. Um, these are the underlying hardware that you're going to use. Um, you construct your real page tables using the actual MFNs. So the page tables here are um, going to be constructed by uh, by the guest. And the guest does its own translation. No need to do any syncing. The guest can read some page tables, um, which means the hardware and dirty and access bits um, will just be maintain, maintained by the hardware. The cost of updating the, the page tables will be reasonably transparent because you'll probably have to make a hypercola to change them and so on. Um, so could we do this? What would it take to actually make this possible? Obviously, it has some problems to solve. So the first problem to solve is naming. Now, in traditional virtualization, the interface that the guests use to map memory is to put a guest physical address into one of its page tables. That's the primary way. 
And so there's no way for um, a, a, a guest in a traditional thing to even name uh, pages owned by someone else on the system. Does that make sense? So the only way in general, I mean, unless you get some kind of a hypercola or something like that outside the normal system, the only way in nor um, a normal guest can access memory is for it to be in, in, in the P to M table. And so the other guests, the, the hypervisor memory and the other guest memory isn't even in the P to M table at all. So there's no way for, there's not even a question of permissions. Um, the guest can't even ask to map some other guest's um, name. Uh, so if it's, in the, if it's in the guest P to M table, it's allowed to map it. If it's not in the guest P to M table, it's not allowed to map it. Um, and the lock um, for a P to M table would typically be, P, be per domain. And particularly back at this time, when you only have one or two vCPU guests, um, it's pretty reasonable to say, I'm going to hold the lock, see if it's in the P to M table, do something with it, and then release it, right? This modification of who owns what and stuff like that using, using the lock um, is something that is uh, completely reasonable. Uh, for PV page tables, all of the host memory is named, right? So uh, the guest can name any MFN on the system. So every time, and, and the hypercalls are all using MFNs as well, which means that the hypervisor needs to be, have some way of, of, of determining um, at any given time who owns this page and that this guest is allowed to access this page. And having something like a global lock is simply non-scalable. Okay, you can't have all the hypercalls and all the things in a system grab a lock, do whatever it's going to do, and then release it if it's a global lock on the whole system. So the solution that was come up with this is the general reference count. There's two different kinds of reference counts in SEM. Um, the general reference count is the more simple version. That's why we're covering that one first. So the idea is this: you want to be able to do something like this. You want to be able to call get page. This is within the hypervisor, for, with a pointer to a page struct and a domain. If get page returns success, then the owner of that page is that domain that you asked for, and it will stay that way. The, the owner of the name will not change until um, as long as you hold that reference and until you call put page and then release that reference. Um, get page will fail if the count is zero. Um, so if the, the, it already has to have been had have a reference there um, for get page to succeed at all. And when the reference count drops back to zero, then the page ends up being freed. Uh, so just to um, give you a brief introduction to how a lot of things these things work. Uh, so here, this is what's called a compare exchange loop. Um, the idea is it relies on this operation compare exchange, which um, it will read a value, see if it is equal to, to some other value. And if these values are equal, it will replace it with the third value. Okay, so the idea is what you do is you, you read the value that you're going to, you, you, you read the value that you want to act on, you do a whole bunch of processing to say, if it's this value, when I come to the compare exchange, what, what do I want to replace it with? Then you um, go to the end and you actually try compare exchange. And if the compare exchange works, then everything is fine and you can you carry on. If the compare exchange fails, meaning that the, the, the value that's in here is not equal to the value you're expecting, you just go through the loop again. So you just go through the loop until you, you just keep trying until you manage to do the swap that you were expecting to do. Um, and as we can see in this case, basically what we're checking for here is this will fail if the count for the count info is zero, as we've said. Will also fail if it's minus one, which means adding one will overflow it, or if it's minus two because we're, we're we actually reserve one for um, for another purpose. So basically, if it's zero, minus one, or minus two, um, then uh, we, uh, we 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 don't let it happen. Otherwise. We just try and increase it by one and see what happens. Um, so of course, now we have a chicken and egg problem. So you can't uh, you can't call get page on any random page without a reference already. Okay, so how do we um, how do we actually allocate a page? So the idea here is there's a bit inside that um, count info. Um, which is called PGC allocated. And this PGC allocated itself holds a reference. So what happens is inside alloc DOM heap pages, okay, so inside of there, they have all these pages on free lists which have a zero reference count. Um, it pulls one of the pages off and decides, and the, one of the very last things that it does before it, it hands a page back is it sets count info to have the PGC allocated bit set and the count equal to one. and the instant, the instant that memory write is visible to anyone else on the system, 
the guest has ownership of that page and can do things with it, even before the dump heap pages returns. Um, so the guest may not know it has access to that page, but if it can guess, so for instance, you could have you could have one processor, one virtual CPU saying, allocate me a new page, and the other processor, um, vCPU, guessing what MFN it's going to get, and then saying, free this page, or just do something else with this page. So the instant that um, count info um, has the PGC allocated and um, uh, the type in there, then some other vCPU, some other part of the system can actually use it. So PGC allocated holds one reference, which means um, uh, if you want to free the page, what you do is you call put page alloc ref. And put page alloc ref will test and clear a bit. And again, this is an atomic operation. So even if lots of processors are trying to do this at the same time, only one of them will actually su succeed in clearing the bit. And whichever one cleared the bit will then um, drop, the, drop the type count. And it's guaranteed this is, this is only going to happen once. Okay, so quick quiz. Can anyone want to tell me what is wrong with this code? So we have uh, alloc dom heap. We call alloc dom heap page. We get a page back. We do something with the page for a bit. Later, we try to free the page, and we just call put page alloc ref. Anyone want to tell me what's wrong with this? Not Andy. Someone else could have called it before you. Right. So you don't know that you actually own this page anymore. So as I said, um, any, any, anywhere, anywhere between here that you're not holding a reference, that you yourself are not holding a reference, um, means that someone else, the, the page ownership might change. And so if you call this without, uh, you have to first call get page. So you should be doing something like this. So you call get page to the page. If that succeeds, then you call put page alloc ref. Um, that will, so, so um, if this succeeds, you'll have a, 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 a count of at least one, uh, sorry, at least two, right? You call put um, put page alloc ref, that might clear the, um, the PGC allocated bit. Um, bringing it down to one, and then you drop your own reference count. And this is a point where, if no one else holds a reference, the actual free could happen. Okay, so hopefully, give this gives you a bit of a taste for the kind of thinking that has to happen when you're when you're dealing with the stuff inside of them. Um, there's more subtlety we're, we're not going to cover in this talk. Um, so, okay, the next problem we have is preventing guest write accesses. Okay, so if you can get a writable mapping of a live page table, that means that you can write you can access any. Um, uh, memory on the system. So we have to have a rule. Any page that is used as a page table must not gain a writable mapping. And any page that has a writable mapping must not be used as a page table. So how are we going to do this? The solution that they came up with was an idea called a type count. So the rule is um, every, um, every page has uh, a type info, and it has a type with a type count. Um, each Exclusive use of the each page which has to each use which must be used exclusively must have its own type. So, for instance, if you're going to use it as a writable page, you can't use it as other types. So that has its own type. If you're going to use it as um, um, an L1, you can't use it as writable or as L2. So that has to have a type. So there's writable L1, L2, um, and so on. The type can change, but only if the type count is zero. And the idea is that before using it for some purpose, you grab the type that is associated with that purpose, and then you use it, OK? So if you want to write the page, first you try to grab a writable type count. Um, if that succeeds, then you add a writable mapping, or you write to it, you do whatever you need. And then you remove the writable mapping, and then you drop drop the type count. If you want to use it at a page table, you first grab an, um, an L1 page, a table type. If that succeeds, then you make the mapping and start using it as an L1 table. Then you, then you stop using it as an L1 table and release the type count. OK, so we can see here, um, this is a uh, kind of a, a transistor state diagram simplified somewhat. Um, so all the pages started as none. So the type none with uh, a count of 0. If you call get type writable, it will say, well, it's not a writable type, but the count is 0, so we can change it. So we change it for, to um, type writable and a count of 1. Um, and then further uh, get types will say, well, if you say get type writable, um, it will say it's already a writable type, so we'll just increase the, increase the number. Um, put type will bring it down to one. A final put type will, will bring it down to it will leave the type as writable, um, but leave the count as zero. Uh, similarly, um, 
if it's in any of these states, if you call get type um, element table, it will say it's not the same type, but we can change it. So we can convert the type to element table, give it a, a one count, um, and so on. And so if you do this, this will um, guarantee that you um, never use a page, that if you have a writable mapping to a page, it will not be used as a page table. Or if you have a page being used as a page table, you will never gain a writable mapping to the page. Um, yes. So this is a little bit out of order, but I think it's simple, so we'll, we'll put it here. So the next problem we have is um, of device pass-through. So obviously, um, if, you, if you want to be able to read from a device into your guest memory, have, a, have, the, have, the, have the device write into your guest memory, it has to have a writable mapping in your IMMU. Um, so pages must have a writable mapping in the IMMU for devices to DMA to them. Page tables must not have a, have a writable mapping in the IMMU. For obvious reasons, because then the um, if the guest can write to it, cause a device to write to it, then it can map any page on the system. And we don't at the moment have any PV IMMUs, so there's no way the guest can explicitly tell the hypervisor use this page as a um, add this mapping to the IMMU. So the solution is to add and remove a write um, an IMMU mapping to the, to the page on the writable transition change. Right. So we start it as zero with no mapping. When we change to writable, we add a mapping in the IMMU. Um, and even we go back to, um, even if we remove that, that writable mapping, as long as the type remains writable zero, then it will have um, a mapping in the IMMU. And then if it's then used as a page table, it will, uh, as we grab, if we change the type from writable into element table, then we will remove the mapping from the IMMU. Um, that will solve that problem. Okay, so the next problem is validation. This. Uh, thing here turns out to be this transition here turns out to be too simple, because of course before you can use a page as a page table, it then has to actually check all of the entries, and that means if you have for an L1 table, that means you have to go through and get a general reference count for every present entry, and you have to grab a writable type count for every writable entry. If you have a higher level page table, like an L2 page table, you have to go and get a, again. You have to get a general reference count for every entry, and then again you have to get um, an L1. Uh, type count for, um, for for all the entries as well. And that takes time. It's not the kind of thing that you can do inside of a compare exchange loop. So the solution here is something that I call validation lock. Um, so here we have the slightly more um, uh, complicated picture. So the idea here is that when you're when you when you're calling get page, so, so first of all, if you're if you're changing to the writable type, you can just write it immediately because there's no validation that needs to happen for um, writable. And just for fun, if you call put type, um, you keep the validated thing on a, on a writable uh, thing, even though the thing is zero. OK, but four things that need validation. The first thing you do is um, a page cannot be used uh, as its type until the validated bit is set. OK, so we have another bit inside of that type info uh, word that we allocate this validated bit. Um, if you find the type count to be zero, then and you need to validate it, then what you do is you set the type to the type and a uh, reference count of one with the validated bit clear. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if your compare exchange succeeds and you are the one who set it to one without setting the validated bit, it is now your job to go and validate that page, okay? So you go and you validate that page and when you're done, well, if it fails, of course, then you, you put it back, uh, you drop the type, the, the, the reference count again. Um, and you return an error. If it succeeds, then you set the validated bit. And then afterwards, anyone who comes along will can just bump the count again. Um, when you uh, when you go to put page, if you would be the one that would set the count to zero, again, you simply clear the validated bit, and now it's in this state where you have the the, the type and um, and a non-zero re reference count, but no validated bit, and then you um, uh, and and then you drop it. And the rule is that if you come to do your compare exchange and you find that it, when you do the read, you find a type count, uh, sorry, a, a type with a non-zero uh, reference uh, count, um, right, type count, and no validated bit, then you have to spin and wait. Um, you just keep reading it until one of the, those things changes, right? So you see why I call this like a validation lock. So it's a bit like a spin lock, except in reverse, because um but actually just more complicated because if it's zero if if 
the bit is clear and the value is zero, you can do something. If the bit is set and the valid is positive, you can do something. If the bit is clear and the value is positive, you have to wait. OK. Um, I've described the put page rules kind of already. Um, so you simply clear the validated bit, you do the devalid devalidation, and then you and then you um, uh, you you th then you set the count to zero again. Um, and it shouldn't be possible for um, to call put page if you're in this validation lock state. Um, because to do so, to, to to call put page here, so to call put page, you you have to own, you have to have a type that you can put. Um, if someone else already called put page when there's only one one type count, then um, it shouldn't be like, then you shouldn't possibly have a type. And if you, um, in the code, if you find that that's the case, then someone has done a, a you know, the type count has, has been all screwed up and the best thing you can do is crash Zen because otherwise it's certainly going to be a privilege escalation. Um, and just to be clear, this is, um, these are actually the same from 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 a the bits there that it's actually the same state, right? So I'm just saying this is this is the get path saying who's doing something in the put path. But as far as anyone else that's coming and re reading this, they can't tell what is a get or a put. Um, okay, is there? I just want to make sure there's are people following along so far. Is this? Uh, if you're confused, go set your status to confused, and we'll see if we can <laughs> do something with that. Okay, so okay, the next problem um, is what might call promotion demotion thrashing. Okay, so the very 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 first implementation of, of, of Zen, um, of course, what they said is okay. Well, when we when the guest says take this L two and put it on our virtual CR three, then we will try and grab the try and grab a, a type count, which may mean promoting the page, which may mean promoting all the L one pages, and then when the um, when we switch away from that process, we will drop that type count, which will may which may cause this page to be devalidated, which may cause all these pages to be devalidated. devalidated. Um, which means um, the, the most common case when you're switching doing a context switch is that you um, every time you switch to a process, you have to validate the whole tree, and every time you switch away, you devalidate the whole tree. Right. Well, that's a huge waste of time. So they added this thing called pinning. So the guest kernel can um, uh, call MMUX to pin uh, L4 table. Oh, I'm almost out of time, aren't I? So the next session starts at five. Okay, sorry guys. Um, okay, here's the hard part that I just don't have time to explain, okay? The, the, the big problem here is recursive promotion and demotion. Um, for L2 tables, recursively promoting and demoting the whole page kind of made sense. Um, when you have four levels of page tables, um, which, you know, when exit the 64 bit came out, that, that was a thing. Um, you have to, this might take an arbitrary amount of time and the guest can make it so that all the, the basically every L1 on, on, that it owns, every page that it owns can be an L1. Um, so, and the automatic promotion was already part of the stable ABI. So what we did is we said, what we need to do is we need to be able to, um, do partial validation. So Zen has a normal thing where you can do a hyper call. And then if the hyper call is running too long, you can just, you know, Zen will back up, go back to the guest and restart the hyper call and then pick up where, where it left off. So can we pick up the, the promotion where, where we left off? Um, so the idea would be, okay, you start to promotion, you have, this is a partially validated, this is fully validated, and then you get interrupted. You come, maybe you get a little bit further. So now these are validated, but these are only partially validated. Um, then you get a little bit further, these are all validated, this is partially validated, and so on. And finally, um, the last time you managed to, to do the whole thing. Um, this is a nightmare, guys. This is just really, really crazy. It is so complicated there are so many corner cases there are so many race conditions and um even though i spent six months trying to fix this stuff because this is where a lot of the race condition stuff come came from um uh like every time i go to this code it takes me at least a couple hours to like go through it and figure out how it works again okay um so i'm not sure what to do here so we're we're, we're out of time it looks like
I am right. I didn't. I didn't mix, mix this up. It, we, we are out of time, right? Uh, okay. Well, maybe I will make a. I'm not sure. Anyway, w w let's call this. Uh, let's call it. Call this. Bring the session to a close, and maybe I can um, either doing a break or maybe start a um, design session. Is kind of filling up, um, but maybe do a design session while I, while I finish this up. Um, but. Yeah, this is this is the hard bit. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, I thought this was only going to take half an hour. I didn't realize I was going so close over time. Uh, okay, right. So this is a partial state diagram. We, we've added in the the partial state. Okay. Um, also note that I changed this to L two table because um, the basic idea is you can do one full. Um, I don't want to do. Sorry. Uh, let's turn on my, my video here. You can do one full um, page table um, in an appropriate amount of time. But basically, if you do more than one page table or an essay page table, then you have to be able to preempt it, right? Um, so L1s, you can just do the whole thing. So you don't, you never do a partial L1 table. You only do partial L2, L3, or L4. Okay. Um, so if you'll notice, uh, it's the same uh, validate lock state, but there's more exits now. Okay, so one of the exits is still um, success. If you manage to validate the whole table and you don't need to, to be interrupted, then it's validated and everything is fine, okay? Um, the fail mechanism, now because um, when you fail, you have to devalidate the page, and devalidating the page might also take a long time, but it might also need to be interrupted. And so now the fail mechanism actually switches it to the PGT partial state. Um, and basically, I mean, if there's a complicated way to arrange that, that, that the PGT partial bit is cleared and then it ends up um, being actually devalidated and, and put. And I just don't have time to, to cover that. That's another thing that makes it super complicated. Um, the two other ways that you can return from the, um, uh, from the validation code um, is e-enter and, and e-restart. So basically, when, when you start to do the, 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 the devalidation, you might get the signal from the hypervisor saying, no, now you need to preempt before you've actually done anything. And so you need, you need to have a way of saying, um, of when, you're, um, when you're doing your, your validation, you need to have, have a way of telling the, the, the system, um, I, I started to do it, but I didn't actually do anything, um, and I got interrupted, versus I have done some stuff, and then I got interrupted, so it's partially done, right? And in so inside the nm.c code, we make this distinction. E enter means I didn't actually get a chance to do anything. E restart means I did some stuff, and then I got interrupted. So there's some stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Okay. So if you get an e, if if you are interrupted before you manage to actually do anything, then you basically go back to the the state that you were um, with a zero zero type count. If you get the restart, then you go into the, the into the partial state, and then of course um, the whole operation should be paused. And then when it get, comes back again, theoretically, what's supposed to happen is you call get L two table again. It notices that it's in the this partial state, and then clears the partial bit, which um, grabs the the validation lock, continues validation where it picked up from. Now the next challenge is, I mean, th there's a whole slew of stuff that I, that I haven't talked about, which is very complicated, which is how do you know how far you got in each page thing? Um, and there's a whole slew of things about like sort of re reference counting and, and this kind of stuff, but it, it's just really complicated. I don't have time to get into. Um, but the idea is that basically you can flip back and forth between these, you know, e restart and, you know, whatever until you get a success or until you get a failure. Um, similarly, when you, um, when you do a put page, then you, uh, you go into the, the validation lock, the devalidation lock state again. Um, there's no, so, and again, you can get, in, um, devalidation can't fail, but you can get an interrupt. Um, you can be stopped before you manage to do anything. And then you just have to go put your validation bit back. Um, if you are interrupted after you've done something, then you end up here in the state. And again, you can sort of, um, go around in a loop until you, uh, until you finish devalidating. Now, the thing is, um, it's actually very, very important that you don't that you, you can call put put page type on a page that's validated, but you must not call a normal put page type 
Can I zoom in here a bit? Yeah, you must not call a normal clip page type on a partial, partially validated page because that basically causes race conditions where you can you can drop a, a type count. Okay. Um, if you if while you're putting a page, you get in, interrupted. Um, uh, if, 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 if while you're devaluing a page, you get interrupted, you have to arrange for a special put page type to be called. And this is put with, with this flag, PTF partial set. And what that means is, I think this page has been partially validated or devalidated. Um, check the bit. If it is still partially validated, then devalidate it. If someone else has come and either revalidated it or um devalidated it already don't do anything at all okay and that was the key thing that um and and so now you need to there's a whole slew of, of mechanisms to make sure that um uh that a partially devalidated page um has this put type on it um someone's typing i certainly am i don't know what that is okay um uh to to make sure that the put type um, is called appropriately. Um, other things that you need to, uh, other complications. So we've talked about, so there's, you can have multiple simultaneous promotions, right? So you can partially promote um, a page and then have another vCPU come in and pick that up and partially promote it again. You can have intersecting promotional trees, right? So you have th this tree here and this tree here and they, they, they the two different um, L4 entries, but you can have shared entries down at the bottom. Um, you can have some things that are trying to promote it, while other things are trying to demote it, right? So you could sort of, you can unpin a page and start to demote the page. You have someone else kind of promote it partially and demote it. Basically, you can have these two things kind of promoting and demoting um, until one of them completes. Um, you have to deal with reference counts, the general reference counts, because um, as long as you have a, uh, a a page with with a PGD partial thing um, doesn't have a type count officially. That's why you can't put a put a type on it. But it does need to be hold. You do need to hold a general reference count because it, it's not allowed to change to a different um, uh, change to a different domain ownership to a different domain. Um, how do you make sure that you actually finish devalidating the page that you've started devalidating? Um, how do you deal with domain destruction if a domain dies when there's pages that are halfway through? It's it's all quite complicated. Um, so the key thing, and, and the, the key thing that made this all happen was the automatic recursive promotion, right? Um, so uh, the, I think the long-term thing going forward, which I would love to be able to do, is to say we don't do automatic promotion, okay? If you want a page to be used as a page for, for validated pages, if you, want to use, if you want to use a page as a page table, you first have to pin it as an L1. Um, and then if you and then and then you have to pin your L2s. And if um, if you're if when you're validating your L2, you find an L1 that is not already validated as an L1, you just have to fail. Okay. We would have a special so a no, the normal get type operations would fail um, for things that aren't already validated. You'd have a special get type with promotion um, thing for pin and unpin operations. Um, and the pin would only permit that page. Sub pages would not be allowed to, to be promoted. Um, and if you did that, then you could get away with the entire, the whole sort of recursive um, uh, partial validation thing. And what you, should, what you would have left um, is something that's actually not too much more complicated, actually, actually probably somewhat simpler than a highly performing shadow page table um, Thing. I, I still fundamentally think there's two options. You can do well. You can do hardware assisted paging. You can do shadow page tables, and you can do um, this option, pair, pair virtualized page tables. I can't really think of another high level thing. And really, if you get rid of the the partial promotion thing um, with the recursive, you know, trees and whatever, um, it's not actually that much more complicated to the what I showed you before before you, you take out the partial thing than uh, a shadow a highly performing shadow page table optimization is, is probably actually simpler. Um, so the challenge here would be required um, dealing effectively with old guests. Um, uh, things that are not covered, linear page tables. Um, one easy trick to access your page tables. Uh, right. 
so here we have our uh, yeah. So our, that's about all I had for this. Is there any questions? Can these diagrams find their way into some Zen documentation somewhere, please? Yes. Because <laughs> we desperately need this written down. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I didn't come to the earlier part of your talk. Uh, I was in the other stream, but sure. uh, for, for anyone who wasn't, uh, for anyone that wasn't aware, this took up a large amount of the security team's time just trying to figure out what was safe and what was not. And yeah. I say that it was mostly George's time, but there was there was a lot of time with the rest of us trying to figure out what was going on. Yeah, it's it's just so complicated, and, and, and every time you go away for a week and you come back and you just can't you, you can't remember what, it, what what the problems and stuff are. Um, I ended up actually using a uh, formal validation tool. Um, I forget the name of it. The one by Leslie Lamport um, had to actually model uh, model the old the old system in his validation tool, and then have it find all the bugs that that I'd already found, and then put my new system in the validation tool and run it, and and so. It didn't find any bugs, um, so that's you know reassuring. Um, <laughs> so Stefan, and start typing. Do you want to turn on your uh, audio or something? No, George, I didn't want to distract you. I was replying to an earlier question. Oh, I see. I see. OK. The funny thing is, um, you know, for HVM, one of the things that, you know, uh, after actually learning about other stuff, OK, um, and understanding how it, how it worked, and if we could just cross off the, the, the partial, you know, the PGD partial thing, um, the other thing that this doesn't, that doesn't have is uh, shadow super pages. Um, so that's kind of a that that's a performance issue right now. As uh, um, we don't really have a good way of having uh, super pages for either well, either for shadow, but also for 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 for, for PV guests. Um, the uh, one of the, one of the things about this though is that it's quite highly parallelizable um, because um, there's not a single lock. Every page has its own separate lock to do all these operations. And so, you know, the different pages of the system can just kind of do their own thing. Um, and one of the bottlenecks that we've that we've run across, um, I'm, I'm told, with the HVM scalability of having more than 32 vCPUs for a guest is actually a single lock for the PTM table. Um, it may come down to the fact that we may need to actually do something inspired by or related to something like this um, to be able to scale past 32 vCPUs. Um, Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. But. OK, well, if there are no other questions, um, yeah, I would, this is definitely going to make its way into some documentation um, uh, at some point. And I will see everyone. So, real quick, George, so what's your plan? Uh, so from what I understand, you said you've got this cleaned up. Um, what's your plan moving forward? Are, is uh, is this going to kind of be optimized or cleaned or kind of faded away or what? Or did I miss it? Oh, um, as long as we have PV guests, we need something like this, right? I mean, so we need this, this interface. We need to run older PV guests. Um, so, and as I said, actually, most of this stuff, I mean, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's not actually that complicated. It, and particularly, I mean, shadow page tables are very, very complicated as well. Um, I spent a bit of time, I mean, because HVM guests, before hardware assisted paging came in, um, we had to have shadow page tables as well. Um, right. And we spent, a, I mean, I, back in the late 2000s, I spent a huge amount of time working on the shadow page table implementation, right? So basically, if you cross off the partial the partial promotion thing, and this is actually probably a little bit simpler um, than, uh, you know, than our, it's probably simpler than our, than our shadow page table code. Um, I think for the, I mean, there's people who are going to want to run PV guests for quite a while. For people who want to run it for um, backwards compatibility to run older systems, um, there's people who are going to want to run 
inside another virtual machine without needing nested virtual nested hardware support. Um, so uh, I think PV is going to be with us kind of for a while, and as long as we have PV, we're going to have um, a system sort of like this. Um, yeah. Okay. So you think so you think it's in a good state where it's at now then? Well, I think that it's um, what okay the. the <laughs> the, partial, the partial page table stuff is just is really complicated. I like we haven't been able to find any bugs, um, but that doesn't mean there aren't any, you know. And it's every time you go to it, you have to spend an hour or two refiguring out what, what's actually going on. And and you can't be and, and if you make a little mistake, then you know then you know it's it's privilege escalation, right? So I would love to be able to actually just get rid of the partial page table stuff. Um, this would involve First of all, finding out if there's any guests that actually use the automatic promotion, um, because obviously automatic promotion is, is I, I mean, if you automatic, I mean, if you do the automatic promotion, then that, then that means um, it automatically demotes as well, um, and you get that page table thrashing thing. So really, I mean, any operating system that wants to do have um, predictable performance should be pinning the pages before they use them anyway, right? Um, so so then, I mean, how many people, how many PV operating systems are there out there right now? Uh, well, there's Linux, there's NetBSD, um, there is uh, Novell Netware, which I guess Zusa still has some customers using, and they're still supporting them. Okay. Um, and, and the, the uh, answer is the answer is fairly few, but all of these use um, the use the partial state because. Uh, things like the PVOP for uh, writable page tables is something that Linux depends on at the moment. So uh, th uh, Linux ends up using the par uh, the partial uh, depromotion because it has one code path where it uses a compare and exchange to drop the final ref on a mid-level page table. Right. Um, so and in reality, Linux would get faster if we turn that from uh, com an emulated compare and exchange into a hyper call. Yeah. But so, I mean, I guess that's the question. Should, should, well, I mean, everybody's plate is full, right? So, I mean, should that be the, the move forward is to try to get all the PV operating systems to drop this? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then I think basically what would happen is, um, th so then we, we, we would actually, so we would actually need to figure out how to run older systems, right? Um, so one option could be to say, well, look, if you're going to run an older system, you just have to run it in a PV shim. Um, and then what can happen is, um, if inside your PV shim, uh, you the, 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 the page table operation takes you know 30 seconds, that's your problem. It doesn't affect anybody else, right? Right. Um, there might be some other things we can do too, you know, but. Uh, so I, hmm, I guess that's the question is, could you push everybody to start using PV shim from the hypervisor side, start pushing everybody to use PV shim until and motivate people to fix the PV operating systems? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that, that's a potential potential thing to do. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I discussed this briefly with Jurgen um, before the thing went public. Um, uh, back in, I think it was not November, maybe October, November, something like that. Um, but basically, just since then, I haven't had time to um, to, to pursue that. And it's not a, if it's not like an urgent, you, you know, uh, uh, topic. We're going to have to keep the partial thing there for for a while anyway. Um, but yeah, the sooner we start to get operating systems switched over to uh, um, explicitly pinning every page and not having the automatic promotion, then uh, then the better. The, the sooner we can just shovel the old operating systems into a PV shim or something. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay.